Washington today. I'll give you a second. The Feast of Corpus Christi. And uh, first of all, and they're going to be here in Kentucky for this, uh, this holy feast. And then first of all, the uh, announcement. Since um, I guess there's been a few con concerns of uh, very worried people that we have uh, the uh, seminarians serving as priests on the altar. And this is a very grave scandal. Well, you shouldn't be shocked since we specialize in scandals. <laughs> So that's what we specialize at here at Lady Mount Carmel. And that uh, there have been some commentaries, I suppose, of some concerned Catholics that uh, we have three priests in the sanctuary. Now remember, at the Latin Tridentine Mass, no matter uh, whether the, there are 100 priests of the Mass, three priests of the Mass, 50 priests of the Mass, two priests of the Mass, there is only one priest who celebrates the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, because the Mass is the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Mass is the crucifixion of our Lord, therefore only one priest celebrates the Mass. And then also <clears throat> that uh, there are servers at the Mass, the ministers, the ministers are the deacon and the subdeacon. Sometimes because there are not enough actual deacons running around or subdeacons running around, then uh, the deacon can be replaced by a priest. So that even though I am a priest of God, I am not functioning as priest at this holy mass. The priest of this mass is Father Pancras, who is the celebrant of the mass, who will make Christ present and make the crucifixion take place at the time of the mass. The deacon is an assistant who participates in the priesthood, has the right to preach the like sermon like I'm doing right now, and has the right to uh, sing the Holy Gospel. It's his great privilege to sing the Holy Gospel as well as to remove the Blessed Sacrament from the altar and place it on the altar and prepare it, put it into the hands of the priest and also to be able to administer the Sacrament of Holy Communion to the faithful. This is the role of the deacon. And that the, the uh, and this Mass has function as a deacon even though I'm a priest. The deacon is part of the Sacrament of Holy Orders which is stated in the plural, holy orders, because there is more than one order. The lowest order is called porter, the doorkeeper who rings the bell. It is a priestly function to ring the bell, so you should always be scandalized whenever you hear someone who is not a priest ring a bell, because that is a priestly duty to ring the bell. Also, whenever a door is opened and closed in a church, always be scandalized, because it is a priestly duty to open and close doors in churches. We have so many scandals today, at least 50 to 60 different scandals of you walking into this church and, and having someone other than a priest open and close the door for you. It is the duty of the priest to open and close the door, the porter, and then the lector. He is the one who sings the uh, lower lessons. He is also allowed to sing the epistle uh, and the, uh, the, the, the sing the epistle. Now then uh, the subdeacon is considered the first of the major orders but because he doesn't, he doesn't have the most sacred priestly functions, in the case of the subdeacon, who is uh, like at this, this mass, uh, I won't name the subdeacon because it would be a scandal to everyone, but he's one of the seminarians. And that uh, the subdeacon is the one who, who is the, uh, uh, assists in bringing the chalice to the altar. That's his primary duty. And that since he has, uh, he's not... Uh, those who are not real subdeacons, those who, anyone who is a tonsured cleric, is allowed to serve uh, in the place of a subdeacon. He is not able to do the most sacred functions of the subdeacon, but he is able to serve in the place of the subdeacon. We call them scrub subs or straw subdeacon. So the, the uh, scrub sub is a, or the straw subdeacon who serves in the place of the subdeacon, if he's, as long as he's a tonsured cleric. And that uh, so they were the, the three of the holy theologians were tonsured uh, on the, the feast uh, on, uh, just a little while ago on March the 19th. Therefore, they're able to serve the office of the subdeacon. However, there are two things of the subdeacon that they cannot do because they're not real subdeacons. The real subdeacon 
at the end, and you cannot see it if you're from the, unless you're not the altar, but the real subdeacon, he touches the pall once during the Mass and removes it from the chalice just before it is consumed. To touch it once during the Mass before it's consumed, he must take a vow of perpetual chastity. He also will purify the chalice at the end of the Mass. Now, the, 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 the three seminarians here, they have taken the vow of perpetual chastity. They've already done that. However, they have not yet been ordained. So, be not yet being ordained to the subdiaconate, they're not able to touch the pall just before the chalice. So, the deacon goes up and does that. At the very end of the Mass, you'll see the deacon will go there and remove the pall rather than the subdeacon. And also, the purification of the chalice should be done by the deacon instead of the subdeacon because the subdeacon is a fake subdeacon, straw subdeacon. And also, for the test, you see the maniple is the vestment of the subdeacon. This is the maniple. And that you'll notice when you see a fake stub deacon, he can wear the maniple. So he can wear the dalmatic or either the tunic, this vestment here, the tunic. For me, it's a dalmatic for the deacon, it's a tunic for the sub deacon. But he cannot wear the maniple. So instead of having a maniple for both of us, there's a maniple only for the deacon and also for the priest. So when he gets ordained a sub deacon, when God allows that to happen, he'll be invested in the maniple, by which he shall be enslaved to the Holy Church and to the office of priesthood, the, and so the first of the major orders. So, and this, we don't run wear the maniple during the sermon, so you can take it down there. Don't give it to him. <laughs> so, in any case, we wouldn't want a scandal. So, and then here the, the, we have here the, the epistle for this feast of Corpus Christi is taken from the first principle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, uh, chapter 11. Brethren, I myself have received, uh, have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread and giving thanks broke and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which shall be given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner also the cup after he had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you shall eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man prove himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks unworthily without distinguishing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment unto himself. In the Gospel, take that according to St. John. Chapter 6. At that time, Jesus said to the crowds of the, G of the Jews, My flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and as I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he shall also live because of me. This is the bread that has come down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and died, he who eats this bread shall live forever. Those are the words of today's Holy Gospel. And Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. The actual Corpus Christi procession and so on will take place on Sunday, and there will be the solemnity of Corpus Christi, the repetition of this Mass on Sunday with the procession of the Blessed Sacrament and the three benedictions. We're not having that today, but on Sunday. A few considerations, and Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. As often as you shall eat this flesh and drink this blood, you shall announce the coming of the Lord until he comes. The death of the Lord until he comes. The little scandal I mentioned at the beginning of the Mass was not mentioned by accident. I don't normally do those things, but since I uh, decided to do so because it is a point to be considered in our sermon, in the contemplation. The Holy Blessed Sacrament, we call it blessed. We call it Eucharist. We don't have don't know how to call it except that it is most blessed what God has done to make his flesh 
and blood available to us even after he has ascended into heaven and available to us all throughout the world at the same time. We normally don't have anyone's flesh and blood like that. It is most blessed. And we call it the Holy Eucharist because we give thanks. The Eucharist means thanks. All we can do is say thank you God for this most wonderful gift of thy own body and thy own blood and thy own soul and thy own divinity handed over to us everywhere in the world. So easily brought down by a few words said by a simple priest. But what is this presence of Christ? St. Paul tells us that for as often as you shall eat this bread and drink the cup, you shall proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. As we were studying in philosophy class, in a little philosophy, the most important foundation of sacred theology, anything that is real must have, must be a substance, the whole substantial body and blood and soul divinity of Christ present in the Holy Eucharist. But in order to be real, it also has to have all nine of the accidents. We won't go through the nine accidents. But what, two of them are time and place. Anything that's real, even an angel that is spiritual, or my ideas that are in my head right now that are traveling through this chapel now on the internet waves as well they in order to be real and they are real they have a place and they have a time there are ideas truths right now located inside of this noggin really located in this mind, inside of this soul. And they are being communicated by means of a mouth, by means of sound, by means of airwaves. And they are to find another place. And this place is to be in your minds, in your noggins, and in your hearts. And there is a time. We are right now in the year 2020. We are in a time of the beginning of the persecution of the church again. We're in a time of the great apostasy. We are in a time in which man does not know and love and serve God. We are in a real time. And these ideas are located in the location of the space of my mind. They are traveling to your minds and hearts, and they are in this time. Now we know that in the Blessed Sacrament, our Lord Jesus Christ is real body, real blood, real soul and divinity, is truly and physically and inside of the host in the tabernacle right now, and soon to be in the host upon the altar at the time of the consecration. What's the time? What's the place? There are several unique elements about this most blessed sacrament. It's God that comes down. And remember on Monday of Holy Week, he came past a fig tree. And the Holy Gospel tells us it was not the season of figs, but it was the season of Jesus Christ. wasn't the season of figs. And our Lord Jesus Christ was hungry. And he wanted a fig. He walked by a fig tree. When should there be figs on a fig tree? Some farmers will tell you that there should be figs on a fig tree during the season of figs. Perhaps that makes some sense. Our Lord Jesus Christ wanted a fig. He wanted it on Monday of Holy Week. 
It was his season. There was no fig upon the tree. And therefore our Lord became angry with the tree and he cursed the tree. He continued on his way into Jerusalem. The next day, the apostles walked by that same tree and they saw that it was dead and withered. What is the season? When Jesus Christ comes into a room, what's the season? When he walks into our life, what's the time? And where is the place? He's real. He is always in time. He is always in place. The body and blood of the Lord is in time. And what is that time? It is the year 33 AD. It is the Friday called good. It is in the afternoon of that Friday. It is at 3 p.m. It is at the moment just after he cried out with an exceedingly loud voice. His voice has just cried out and an exceeding loud cry. Where is it heard? Everywhere in the world. By every man. There isn't anyone that does not hear the cry that came from that mouth upon that cross from that body at 33 AD. The cry is here right now. The time is 3 p.m. And the place is Calvary. Therefore, St. Paul tells us, whenever you shall eat this bread and drink this blood, you shall announce the death of the Lord. For he is a real man with a real body. When a baby is conceived, he's conceived a little infant. But when Christ comes into this host, he comes a 33-year-old man. He comes at the moment of the separation of the body and the blood. At the moment of the separation of the soul from the body. At that moment when the soul was ripped from the body. When the body and blood were separated. The moment of death. The precise instant of death at 3 p.m. on Friday. And when he travels into a room, that's the time. No need to check your watches. No need to check your calendars. No need to check your GPS. The time when Jesus Christ walks in is 3 p.m. The place is Good Friday. It is the moment of his death. He has cried out with a loud voice. And the voice is heard everywhere in the world. And it is announced every time. The priest says in a most low and quiet voice, that should not even normally be heard even by the servers. Hulk est enim carpus me. When these words are spoken over a host, something happens. The body and the blood of our Lord and Savior comes into that host and it is announced We are requested to consume that host. Now what was happening? What was being said? What was the situation at 3 p.m. at Good Friday when he cried out with a loud voice? We must first note that everyone is there. Caiaphas, Annas, the holy women, two thieves, soldiers stuck on duty over time. Passers by the crowd. Friends and enemies alike and those who do not care, they are all there. And they hear the loud cry. He seems so quiet inside that tabernacle. So quiet inside the ciborium, inside the pics. 
so quiet in the host. But he's there. And he speaks. Why can he not be heard? Because everyone else is speaking too. Everyone has something to be scandalized at. Everyone has something to be worried about. Everyone has someone to talk about. We have many things about which we worry. But what did our Lord say shortly before the crucifixion? Martha, Martha. Thou art worried about many things. One thing is necessary. When our Lord Jesus Christ cried out with a loud voice, it was just a loud cry. But in that cry is found the preaching of the last 2,000 years. In that cry is found the preaching of the priests of God who have spoken the divine truth from that moment until the ending of the world. That's what's in that cry. <clears throat> it is going to be heard, it is heard, and will be found everywhere on the every ends of the earth, including in the time of the Antichrist. The voice is carried. And when Lucifer heard the pitch of that voice, when he heard the tone of that voice, he would have remembered only once before have I heard that pitch. Only once before have I heard that loud sound and that, that degree of, of, of power come out of a human voice. And that was the day when the entire Jewish people listened to Joshua and Joshua said, cry out. Cry out with a loud voice. And what did he say to those Jews whom he had told to be silent for seven days? You will cry out with a loud voice to the loudest possibility that the voice can scream. And whoever doth not cry out, let him be put to death. That was the last time that Lucifer had heard such a cry. And what happened? The walls of pride, the impregnable walls of Jericho, fell down because of a cry from a voice at the command of a man named Jesus. You know that Joshua is Jesus, the same name. How are we going to defeat Satan? How are we going to defeat the, defeat the Bilderbergers? How is Christ going to bring about his victory? There must be a loud sound coming from the body of the Lord at the moment of his death. Let it be announced until he comes. And that is why St. Paul says, whoever eats and drinks of this flesh and blood, like those who stood upon the wall of Jericho, they were there receiving the voice. They received the voice. And every one of them received it unto their destruction. Hence St. Paul says, He that eats unworthily, let him eat. But let a man prove himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks unworthily, without distinguishing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment unto himself. Now remember, Rahab was on that same wall. Along there, Rahab the prostitute, along with all those inside of her house. And there were thousands of other soldiers along that same wall and thousands of bystanders to look at and mock the Jews. That sound kept her part of the wall from falling down. It didn't fall. That sound protected the stones at her part of the wall. It protected those inside of that house in which she lived. And the others on the same wall fell in the rubble and died. They did not even have to be slain by the soldiers of Joshua, for the stone and the wall and the sound killed them. This is what it means 
to eat and drink the body of the Lord in the state of mortal sin. We eat and drink unto destruction and the consumption of the host, the eating of the body and blood of our Lord. At the moment that he cried out with a loud voice, at the moment that what was he doing when he cried out with a loud voice? He was ripping down the walls of sin. He was destroying the kingdom of Satan at that very moment. And therefore, whoever belongs to the kingdom of Satan, who has not repented of his sin, who is not sorrow for his sin, and receives the body of the Lord, he receives destruction. Hence the grave scandal of the handing out of Holy Communion to those in bad marriages, like Pope Francis is doing. The sacrilegious reception of Holy Communion on the hands. When a priest is sick, when a priest is dying, on Good Friday, when the priest goes to Holy Communion to another priest, he never receives a host upon the hand, always upon the tongue. Always upon the tongue. Those who receive the body and blood of the Lord upon the hand receive it unto destruction. Those who receive it in the state of mortal sin receive it unto destruction. Because the very body of Christ is speaking with a loud voice. But those upon that same wall, like Rahab the prostitute, and all those inside of her house, those upon that same wall who have repented, who have made a deal with the spies, who believe in the victory of Christ, who believe in the victory of his death, these shall not fall by the sound of that same voice. That same voice that causes the others to collapse shall strengthen them. That same voice that brings about the death of the enemies of God shall protect those that are his friends and those that have repented of their sins. And we must remember, it shall not be armies that defeat Satan. It is the word of God. It is the divine truth. And it shall must be spoken by human flesh. God decided that he would take on human flesh. He decided with a human voice that he would speak. And remember the very wise soldiers who were at the foot of the cross. They thought he was exhausted. They thought he was worn out and was dying with a whimper. They thought his strength was gone from him. In order to prove to those soldiers and to prove to all mankind that he was not worn out, that he was not weak, that he was in the fullness, absolute fullness of his strength, that is why he cried out with an exceedingly loud voice that pierced the heavens, that pierced the entirety of the earth, that caused an earthquake to happen. Just like in those days before when Joshua, when he cried out, the walls of Jericho fell down. But it took the whole Jewish people crying to cause that to happen. But when our Lord Jesus Christ cried out, it caused an earthquake. It caused bodies to rise from the dead. Never has there been a cry like unto that cry. It penetrated into the, the center of hell. It went to the top of the heavens. It defeated death. This cry is in our mystical body, the Holy Roman Catholic Church. It is found nowhere else. It is in the priest of God. When he preaches the word of God, it's not in the faithful. Some cries must be done by a priest. There are many good souls amongst the faithful. God bless them. But they cannot make Christ present upon the altar. And they cannot absolve sins. And they cannot cry as Christ cried. There must be laborers to go into the harvest. There must be a cry. When you come into the church... You come before the Blessed Sacrament. Listen to the cry. 
When a sound becomes exceedingly loud, to those ears that cannot take it, what happens? They go deaf. Just as those who look too mar into a too bright of a light go blind. This cry is very loud. But those that live in sin and those that want not the truth, their eardrums are broken by this cry, and therefore they cannot hear. But they are shaken by it. They are shaken by it. What is the answer to this holy crisis in the church? It is the blessed sacrament. Do we call it blessed only because we're able to receive it? It is blessed because God is delighting to be with us. And what do our fathers tell us? Do not receive Holy Communion unworthily. It is a great sacrilege that brings about the punishment of God. But also, do not receive Holy Communion outside the Holy Church. Don't receive Holy Communion outside the Holy Truth. For this shall do the same thing. As St. John the Almsgiver said, My children, I would rather you never take Holy Communion ever again in your entire life than you receive from the hands of a heretic from the hands of a schismatic. Remember the martyrdom of St. Hermenegild. Why did he die? Because he refused Holy Communion. That's how he became a saint. Had he received Holy Communion, he would be in hell now. He was the son of the king. He was due to be the successor of his father, but his father was an Arian, heretic. And he commanded Hermenegild, his son, to go and receive Holy Communion. Remember Hermenegild, you mothers and fathers. When you go to the invalid marriages of your sons and daughters in order to participate, Hermenegild will meet you on the Day of Judgment if you do not repent. And they all go to Holy Communion. But what did Hermenegild do? He told his father, I will not receive the Holy Eucharist. I will not receive the body and the blood of the Lord from the hands of an Arian heretic. I won't do it. The true Mass was celebrated that day. Christ was validly made consecrated in that host. He was really and truly there, body and blood and soul divinity, inside of that host by that Arian bishop heretic. He was truly brought to the communion table. And Hermenegild refused to receive him because the holiness of the body and blood of the Lord announces the death of the Lord. And what is the death of the Lord announced? It is announced to the death of heresy. It is announced to the death of schism. It is announced to the death of all evil and lies. And here is a man who is going to use the Holy Eucharist in order to unite in schism, in order to unite in heresy. This is the most terrible blasphemy. And Hermenegild will have nothing to do with it. And therefore he says, I shall not receive of the true body and blood of Christ. He's different from our modern wise people. I need my Holy Communion. Is it your Holy Communion? Or is it from God? Is it God who is in the host? Hermenegild said no. And therefore he was killed. And we call him Saint Hermenegild. <laughs> died saint because he refused to receive Holy Communion from a heretic. Because he knew that which the Holy Eucharist is. 
This most blessed and most beautiful sacrament announces the death of the Lord. It announces his victory. It announces his combat. It announces him in the height of his war. I have not come to bring peace but the sword, said our Lord Jesus Christ. And when did he bring that sword? He brought it at 3 p.m. on Good Friday. That's when he brought it. And the priest of God carries the sword of the word of God. This is one reason why we don't carry guns. Just like a good soldier should never carry a water pistol. Maybe good for a shower, but not good for battle. So likewise, the priest of God, he carries the greatest sword and the greatest weapon that there is. And it is the divine truth of our holy gospel. It is the divine truth that came out with a loud voice out of the mouth of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ just before he died. And that loud voice is to be proclaimed and repeated until the ending of times. It must be repeated now. And that is our sword. We do not need the sword 9 millimeter. We have the sword of the word of God. We have the sword of Christ hanging upon that cross. He is attached with his whole body to that sword. He doesn't grip it with his hands. He grips it with his whole body. So likewise, the priest of God with his whole being must grip onto the sword. This way he can never be detached from it. And this sword of the divine truth that the priest of God holds shall conquer the devil. Now right now we are seeing some mysterious signs in our holy church. Bishop Vigano, a few others, these princes of the church are beginning to speak some truth. Not perfectly, but some truth. Hopefully God will give them the grace. Well, he always gives them the grace. Hopefully they will respond to the grace of God. And embrace the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And speak as true princes of God. Not secretly in private letters. But with their mitres upon their head. With their copes. With their staffs. With their croziers. Let them speak the divine truth. And let that truth be as a loud voice. Because there is a grave danger, and that is that they are speaking only a partial truth, as they are doing right now. And therefore, the grave danger of bringing souls back to Vatican II. No, Vatican II is the trouble. Bishop Vigano has been encouraging recently in that he has been saying just very, very recently in the last few weeks, Vatican II is the problem. There's error in problems in the council, the principles of the council. He hasn't yet been able to say the word heresy in the council. But the principles of the council, the council is the cause of troubles. It's much more than that. It's not enough to say that. But it's a step in the right direction. We pray for him to have the grace to say the whole truth. And that whole truth will make him stop celebrating the new mass. That whole truth will make him stop writing in secret. That whole truth will make him speak out publicly. That whole truth will make him establish parishes and establish seminaries. That whole truth will make him speak out as a prince of the church and make him become excommunicated and make him be persecuted by the church even more than he is now. And this shall be his glory if he can only respond to that grace fully. The body and the blood of the Lord is announced. You shall eat this body and drink this blood until the ending of the world until Christ comes with the sound of a trumpet, and this body and blood shall announce his death. It is to announce his death. It's not to make me feel good for a few minutes. It's not to sustain me only for a day. The body and blood of our Lord is to announce the death of the Lord until he comes. And hence, there will always be at least one faithful priest or several faithful, faithful priests in the world Celebrating the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and one is enough, without compromise of heresy, with the union and communion with the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, with the union and communion with our Holy Mother, the Church, and the true and proper union and communion with our Holy Father. This proper, true union and communion can only be by the announcing of the death of the Lord. 
which is slaying hell, which is saving Rahab and all of her children on that wall. It is saving those that are with Rahab, our holy mother of the church. It is killing those that are outside of Rahab and outside of our holy mother of the church. It is calling those who are outside to run to the place of Rahab that they might be saved. And those that do not run to this place, they shall not be saved. It is announcing the divine truth. And what did our Lord Jesus Christ say? I am the truth. What is announced when the body and blood, the true body and blood of Christ in the host, is the truth in a host. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the chalice is the truth in a chalice. Therefore, if we are the enemies of God in mortal sin, let us not receive him, but go to confession first. And if we find that the priest of God who is celebrating the Holy Mass, the true Mass, like that priest that celebrated the Mass of St. Hemenegild, or those priests that went brought Holy Communion to St. Joan of Arc, and she refused the Holy Communion, and Hermenegild refused the Holy Communion because they did not refuse God. They did not refuse the truth. Let us make sure that we announce the body and blood of the Lord, his death, until he comes. He has not yet come. He will come. He will come at the last day. But until he comes, let us take the body and blood of our Lord and announce his coming. Hence, you should not go to the Mass of those that are not with the church. We should announce until he comes. And we'll pray the Lord of the harvest that he send laborers into the harvest and that our concern be are we announcing the truth rather than is he supposed to be wearing that dalmatic, that tunic? Why are they doing that? He's supposed to open that and close that door. Who's supposed to be ringing that bell? They're worrying about these things while souls are being damned. They're worrying about these things while heaven and the divine truth is not being proclaimed. While souls are not living in the grace of God. While they're receiving our Lord Jesus Christ in the state of mortal sin without any care or concern. And we worry about the wrong things. Let's not worry about the wrong things, but keep the divine truth in our hearts, keep the divine truth in our souls, and let us remember that this body and blood announces most loudly, most clearly, his death until he comes. Closing up as you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen.